If you do not have a, a copy of a chart about the patriarchs, the ages of the patriarchs, please uh, raise your hand and we will get you a copy. We have a few over here. I think you did. <laughs> That's what I was looking for. Thank you. <clears throat> ages of the patriarchs. This chart is going to be part of our sermon this morning. <clears throat> Again, if you don't have a copy, raise your hand and Larry will get you one. We're glad that you're with us this morning. <clears throat> Just want to emphasize that Wednesday night we're going to have services as normal. Even though it is Christmas Eve, we're going to have services as normal. Uh, the world, the religious world, makes a big deal out of December 25th. Out of Christmas, the Bible does not. And therefore, we do not as a religious activity. We have a tree at our house. We have gifts. We're going to have family. We're going to exchange gifts. But we're not going to tell people it's the birthday of Christ. And we're not going to tell our children it's the birthday of Christ. Because, first of all, we don't know when he was born. And secondly, Christ said nothing about remembering his birth. We remember the death of Christ every first day of the week because that is what he told us to do. And uh, we will be doing that very shortly. Again, if you do not have this chart, raise your hand and we will get you a copy of this chart because part of the sermon is going to come from the chart. This lesson I'm speaking about uh, this morning, the topic is going to be why did the patriarchs live so long? And this is based upon a question that was asked uh, concerning the long ages that we're going to see in this chart. If you look at the chart, <clears throat> ages of the patriarchs, you see that Adam lived 930 years. Now, in your copy, the, the blue ink didn't come through very well. The chapter and verses are there in the parentheses, but they didn't copy very well. So I hope you're able to see those chapter and verses. We're not going to look up each one of these, but we're just going to go down the list here. We know that Adam and Eve, after they sinned, they were banished from the tree of life so that they would not live forever. That is why physical death uh, occurred, because they were banished from the tree of life. They sinned against God. That brought about their spiritual death. Then banishment from the tree of life uh, caused them to physically die. But you see that Adam lived 930 years. Seth, 912 years. Enosh, 905 years. Kenan, 910 years. Mahalalel, 895 years. Jared, 962 years. Enoch, 365 years, but God took him. In other words, he did not die. He did not see death. He's one of two individuals, Enoch and Elijah of the Old Testament, who did not die. He walked with God, we are told. He was a righteous individual in his generation, and God simply took him into heaven. And there's much about that we do not fully understand. Uh, but we know that he did not see death. Then you come to Methuselah, who lived 969 years, oldest man recorded. And the reason why I say that is because we don't have a record of every single human being upon the earth. What we're seeing here is a traced lineage of Christ. A lineage of Christ traced through Seth, going down through uh, people, each one of these names, the men being mentioned, who are descendants of Adam. So not every single human being is being recorded in the Genesis account, plus the women's women of the genealogy are not being recorded either. And generally speaking, we know that women tend to live longer than men. So there could have been those who lived longer than 969 years. However, we have Methuselah recorded for us. So he is the oldest recorded man in uh, the Bible. And it's very interesting when you calculate his age, he died the year of the flood. It is quite possible he could have died uh, in the flood. Or he could have died before the flood came upon the earth. But he died the year of the flood. Lamech, 777 years. Noah, 950 years. 
Then Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. From them came all of the rest of humanity. We are all descendants of that family. And Shem, 600 years. Arphaxad, 438 years. Shelah, 433 years. Eber, 464 years. Eber, it is believed from that name, the word Hebrew came. So that possibly could be the root word for Hebrew. Peleg, 239 years. Ru, 239 years. Serug, 230 years. Nahor, 148 years. Terah, 205 years. And he is the father of Abraham. And did you notice something about the ages? After the flood, they began to diminish. They began to diminish. Now, I don't have a full listing of all uh, of the people who... uh, are the patriarchs, so if you want to add to this list, Abraham dies at the age of 175, Genesis chapter 25 and verse 7. Isaac dies at 180, Genesis chapter 35 and verse 28. Jacob dies at 147, Genesis 47 and verse 28. And Joseph dies at 110. Genesis chapter 50, verses 22 through 26. How do you go from people living 969 years to 110? And 110 being considered very old. How does that happen? Something significant happened. Look at Genesis chapter 47 and verse 9. Genesis chapter 47 and verse 9. Jacob here is talking to Pharaoh. And notice what he says to Pharaoh. Jacob said to Pharaoh, The days of the years of my sojourning are a hundred and thirty years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life, and they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. My sojourning, my lifespan at this point, he's saying, is 130 years, and that's considered a few days compared to my ancestors. But now he is considered someone who is getting very, very old at the age of 130. And we know that he dies at the age of 147, uh, Genesis 47 and verse uh, 28. But we look around us now, and we understand from Psalm 90 and verse 10, the days of our lives are 70 years, and if by reason of strength they are 80 years, Yet their boast is only labor and sorrow, for it is soon cut off and we fly away. So the psalmist, by inspiration, writes and says, Our days are about 70 years and by reason of strength, 80 years. Then you can find some that could reach 90 years. We have some members that are shut-ins that are in their 90s. You might have heard recently about one of the oldest people who we have on record that has died recently. I believe she was 118 years old. I might be wrong on that figure, but she was up there in uh, 118, pushing 120. And that's considered very, very old. But yet, compared to 969 years, what happened to shorten mankind's lifespan? We have to go back to the very beginning to understand a few things. We have to understand that the way things are now on earth are not the way they've always been. And that's the mistake that science makes in thinking that all the natural processes that are happening now are the same exact natural processes that have always happened in times past. Significant changes have taken place since the initial creation. Let's go back to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We know that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We know based upon uh, Genesis 1 and other passages, both in Old and New Testament, that this is talking about a literal 
week. Not some sort of symbolic week. It's not six billion years. Six days he created the heavens and the earth. On the seventh day he rested. And therefore we understand that this is exactly what happened as he records it for us by the Holy Spirit through his uh, servant Moses. Genesis chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Now notice in the creation here. Then God said, Let there be a firmament in the midst of the heavens, or midst of the waters, excuse me, and let it divide the waters from the waters. A firmament means an expanse. And in fact, some translations might even say that. Let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Verse 7. Thus God made the firmament and divided the waters which were above the firmament from the waters which were below the firmament, and it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. So the evening and the morning were the second day. And look at verse 9. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. So we see here that God is separating water from water. But we know water can exist in, as a solid, as ice, as a vapor, and as a liquid. And we see here the heaven, the atmosphere of the earth is being created, and there are waters above the atmosphere. And then waters below. The waters below, we understand, is the liquid water. Well, what would be the waters above? Some type of vapor. So it has been concluded by those who have studied this that this is referring to a vapor canopy that surrounded the initial earth when it was initially created. And there would be numerous benefits for such uh, an arrangement. It would cause a greenhouse effect. What you have in a greenhouse is you have a protection and you have heat being trapped within a greenhouse to protect your plants. People who have greenhouses today, they're heated on the inside. The sunlight is getting through, but the 20 degree temperature is not going to affect their plants. Because there is a stable temperature within the greenhouse. Well, we know that the earth was initially created in perfection. There was no flaws in the initial creation. So when God created this, He created the earth with the waters that were above the heavens. And from that we can conclude logically that those waters, that vapor canopy that shrouded the earth, acted to protect the earth and shield it, shield the earth from the dangerous effects of the sun. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. Look at verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1. Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. This is talking about after the creation of man and woman, after everything was created. Man and woman were created. They were placed in the Garden of Eden. He saw that everything that he had made, it is very good. Earth was perfect. It was a perfect world, a perfect environment. Is it so today? Step outside. Feel how cold it is. We live in a very different planet than it was initially. And therefore, things have happened. Things have happened. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that God placed a curse upon the earth because of man's sin. Cursed is the ground, he said to Adam. So things were going to be not as they were, he's saying. And we know that curse built up over time. We know that it has an accumulative effect. It is something that is building over time. And we know that from physics, that you have something that's brand new, it wears out. I believe it's called the law of entropy. Everything is winding down. Everything is wearing out. You get a new car in 10 years, it's not a new car anymore. It wears out. We are wearing out. We are getting old. Everything that starts new wears out eventually. And it's part of the curse that's placed upon the earth because of man's sin. Now look at Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 6, God is grieved with the human race. They live vast, long ages. 
and they're very, very wicked. Wicked individuals living a long time have a lot of time to do wicked things and do a lot of damage. And therefore, you have wicked people living hundreds of years. And we have to keep in mind that as Adam lived 930 years, that as he aged, the aging process would be a whole lot slower than it is for us today. So being 930 years would be equivalent to someone in their 90s today. And so as a person who was in their 400s, that would be midlife for them back then. Very different environment. And we know the environmental conditions cause uh, the earth to be pristine, cause the earth to be ideal for long life, for people to live in a wonderful condition. Not perfect anymore because of the curse, but yet the conditions were ripe for a long life. And therefore, people did live extremely long But something happened. Genesis chapter 6 and verse 3, And the Lord said, My spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his day shall be a hundred and twenty years. This is not talking about the age of people. This is talking about how long it would be before the flood came. A hundred and twenty years. Remember Noah, during this time, after he is told to build an ark, we're told by Peter in 1 and 2 Peter, Noah was a preacher of righteousness. During this time, he was preaching. He was building the ark and he was preaching. He was trying to get people to repent, trying to get people to do what was right. So during that period of 120 years, the ark was being prepared. Therefore, we see the flood. Look at Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 through 22. A significant global event took place. And you know, it's very interesting that even within science, those who reject the Bible uh, within science, uh, those who reject the literal interpretation of the historical events of Genesis, even they say, based on their evolutionary thinking, that some sort of global event took place in the past. That's how they tried to explain the extinction of the dinosaurs. They say a comet or an asteroid hit the earth 65 million years ago and changed the environment and there was mass extinction. Even though, even they recognize something significantly changed the earth globally years ago. Well, the Bible has a perfect explanation for that. It's called the global flood. Genesis chapter 6, verses 17 through 22. God says, Behold, I myself, I... Uh, I'm bringing uh, flood waters on the earth to destroy uh, from under heaven all flesh in which is the breath of life. Everything that is on the earth shall die. This is a global event, not local. This is not something that's just a big flood in one area of the earth. This is global. Verse 18. But I will establish my covenant with you and you shall go into the ark. He's already told him to build an ark. Your sons, your wives, and your sons' wives with you. And every living thing of all flesh you shall bring two of every sort into the ark to keep them alive with you. They shall be male and female. Verse 2. Of the birds after their kind, animals after their kind, and every creeping thing of the earth after its kind, two of every kind shall come to you to keep them alive. Verse 21 and 22. And you shall take for yourself of all food that is eaten, and you shall gather it to yourself, and it shall be food for you and for them. Verse 22, Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him, so he did. And that's why we're here today, because Noah obeyed. We wouldn't be here today if it was not for Noah's obedience. And therefore, the human race was preserved. Eight souls were saved through the flood. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 20, and Peter likens that unto baptism today. So we see that this significant event took place. Look at Genesis chapter 7. Genesis chapter 7, verses 11 and 12. In the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, the 17th day of the month, on that day, all the fountains of the great deep were broken up, 
and the windows of heaven were open, and the rain was on the earth forty days and forty nights. This is a global catastrophe. Notice what it says here in verse 11. All of the fountains of the great deep broken up. This is talking about water that's in the crust of the earth that was initially created. All of them throughout the entire world broke up. We're talking about water erupting from the crust of the earth. And not only that, windows of heaven were open. Talking about water coming down, not on just one place on the earth, all over the world. So you got water shooting up from the crust of the earth. You got water, that vapor canopy that was originally created. God caused it to collapse upon the earth. And therefore it rained all over the globe all at once for 40 days and 40 nights. Water erupting from the surface of the earth, coming down upon the surface of the earth in rain, caused tremendous geological upheaval and changes upon the earth. And therefore, as a result of that, you see drastic changes. When Noah and his family got off the ark with all the animals that survived, it was a very different planet. It is believed that during that period of time, shortly after Noah and his family got off the ark, that an ice age took place. The temperatures plummeted and dropped because there would be massive climatic changes all over the world. And again, look at your chart. Notice the line of demarcation between those who lived an average of 912 years before the flood and those who lived after the flood. 950 years for Noah. Remember, he came from before the flood. But look at Shem there, only 600 years. Our facts had 438 years. And notice the numbers drop. The numbers drop. Why? Conditions on earth are different now. We don't have that protection from the sun that humans had in the pre-flood earth. Atmospheric conditions. We have extreme temperatures now on the earth. A few months ago, we had several days in a row that was 100 degrees plus. Now it's 20-something degrees outside. Extreme temperatures. Plus, now, as the human race goes along... One of the problems that we have is genetic mutation. Problems within our genetic makeup. You didn't have that with Adam and Eve. They were perfect. It's fresh from God's hands. They were perfect. They didn't have any genetic defects. But his children and descendants do. And what's the one problem that causes genetic problems and causes all kinds of genetic uh, instability within biological life forms? Son. Sun causes aging. We know that. And therefore, because we don't have that protection like we did before, the flood, that now is gone. We're on an earth that is recovering from a cataclysmic event. Therefore, people's ages began to diminish to the point where you get to Joseph, who died at 110, and that was considered old. We understand now that to live to 110 would be a significant event. Because by reason of strength, we live 70 or 80 years, as Psalm 90 and verse 10 says, but our boast is only labor and sorrow, and soon it is, we shall be cut off and we fly away. So that explains, I believe, in a very condensed way, why they lived vast ages, an average of 912 years before the flood, but now after the flood, we live these shorter lifespans. The fact of the matter is, you can read, as you read the genealogy starting with Adam, you can read one phrase that reoccurs over and over again. And they died. And they died. Except for Enoch. God took him. And they died. It matters not how long they lived, and they died. Death is certain. Hebrews chapter 9 and verse 27 tells us it's appointed that a man wants to die and after that comes the judgment. So it matters not how long we live. What matters is how well we live. What matters is our relationship with God. 
We see that Methuselah lived a lot longer than Enoch, but Methuselah could have died in the flood. That would have meant, by implication, he was a wicked man. Enoch lived a short lifespan according to him, or uh, compared to him, but God took him because he was a righteous man. He walked with God. It matters not how long, but how well we live before God. Therefore, I want to close with these scriptures from Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. Solomon is trying to get us to consider our life as he considers his own life, as he pursued every avenue of human pleasure, found it was vanity, a waste of time. It's like trying to grasp the wind. And he says, here's what matters. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 6 and 7. He says, remember your creator before the silver cord is loosed. Or the golden bowl is broken, or the picture shattered at the fountain, or the well broken, the wheel broken at the well. Then the dust will return to the earth as it was, and the spirit will return to God who gave it. We've got to remember our Creator. In the first verse of chapter 12, he says, You remember your Creator in the days of your youth. Because he's saying in this poetic language, we've got to remember God. We've got to take God seriously. We've got to look at our relationship very seriously. Because once we die, we don't have time to do that anymore. Once that picture is shattered at the well, that golden bowl is broken, there's no way to come back and fix that situation. It is this life that we have to take seriously our relationship with God. Therefore, he says, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 13 and 14, let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep His commandments, for this is man's all. For God will bring every work into judgment, including every secret thing, whether good or evil. It matters not how long we live, but it does matter how well we live in the eyes of God. We need to take seriously our relationship with the Lord and keep His commandments, fear Him, respect Him, love Him, and obey Him. And whether we live to be 110 or just live just a few more years, it will matter not. We will be ready. Perhaps there's someone here this morning that needs to believe and obey the gospel. If you have faith in Jesus Christ, if you're willing to confess He's the Son of God, you're willing to repent of all your sins, we have warm water available. And we can baptize you into Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you've done that and you've gone astray, repent, confess your sins. As always, the choice is yours while we stand and while we sing.